streamline your fundraising experience what would you take out I think I would take out the the guesswork of who to go out to, to see there's so much time wasted and just the desk research required to find out if we're the right fit for them and what they're looking for and if they're the right fit for us so that would probably be the the, the main part of it for me what about yourself I think there's quite a bit of a dance and a show around fundraising, <laughs> and I think um, I think um, I, I, to a certain degree they have to get to know your personality because it's so much about resilience and you have to get to know them. But I would take out a little bit of that show and just focus on the numbers and the actual business. Mm. Um, mm. I, know, I know what you mean. I actually often refer to it as the monkey dance. <laughs> and I'll get yeah, home at the absolutely. end of the day and feel exhausted from performance. Yeah. Because um, there is just so much of that you know, required of you to yeah. be in the room, to be the visionary, the person that they think that they can get behind. And, yeah. You know, it's an interesting piece I don't think that founders consider when they go into us. When managing company money, what role does technology play? Um, it's to become so much easier to do, to run a company, to monitor a company. Um, if I think about sort of account management software, uh, 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 softwares or um, online banking, I mean, I remember just a few years ago, you know, going to the bank, putting in cash money, and and, and having these like uh, standing in the queue, and now everything is online. It's amazing. And uh, for example, like uh, uh, a week ago, I have I, I see all the money that comes out of our company, so I get a feel of what's happening. I have to authorize it, mm. which is such a good system because it never keeps me out of the loop. But I um, I can sometimes you know get caught up with things and just be a little bit late. So then our um, finance uh, lady she chases me and she gets um, she's really good at it and very patient. But then I did it on my phone. That was amazing. I just logged on to like our business account and went like uh, yes, authorized, whatever, and then uh, sent her questions wherever I had questions. So it's it's um, it's just become so much easier, mm. and it's it's yeah fascinating. Mm. Well, as a, a transactional business, so technology and money are you know really close together, and yeah. um, we've had to build out a lot of. Um, platform you know, APIs that enable t different technologies to talk to each other so that we can flow money through the business um, from one entity to another um, and, and we, we act as a payment gateway in between. So we've had to do a lot of jumping through hoops to get that set up. Uh, as you mm -hmm. imagine it's, it's um, a non-trivial process in the first place. Um, but also then breaking that down to make that really simple for people who are running SMEs because that's a big part of our business mm -hmm. is the you know, the end is the salon. Yeah. Um, and so that the, the role of technology and money within that for us is providing reporting and really simplified what I call usable data yeah. way so that they can actually see the benefit of what is happening here. Yeah. And technology has been a great way for us to be able to demonstrate very clearly that their companies have become more profitable by yeah. working with our software. Yeah, yeah. When it's time to fundraise, where do you go for advice? It's a very good question because advice comes from every single person you run into, I find. Um, everybody has an opinion. Yeah. Um, so filtering that advice is, is pretty critical. Um, I've been raising money for a long time, 20 years uh, since I raised my first startup. This is my fifth startup. Yeah. So uh, I've got good at listening to my gut um, and really trying to figure out what are the right connections to give me a fresh perspective and to give me a fresh network. Um, who may be able to add an additional value to the process. Um, so networks are really important to me, introductions um, and fresh eyes. So I, I definitely ask for help. Fascinating getting started here in London because I was brand new two years ago. Uh, I put it on LinkedIn. I asked, I, I just put it out to the universe and said I'm looking for help to introducing into people who can help us with this. Mm -hmm. And in fact, my first two clients came out of that. It's amazing. People will help you if you ask. Yes. Yeah. What about yourself? It's almost like you, the, the money, like as in whoever puts money into you right now is very lucky because you're so convinced about where the direction is going. And I'm such a, um, I'm so 
honest as a person that that works for me, but when it's when when you're sort of not certain, it's really difficult. But mm. when you are in that mindset, then it's really about just the form to put around and maybe the timings. Um, and when I um, am thinking of fundraising or planning the years ahead, um, I do something. I go. I, I speak to especially one very a person who's at a VC and has that sort of mindset, but is very friendly in the sense of that uh, I can be very open. And I and I say like, look, if if I came through your door, what do you need to see to think this is a killer opportunity? And that's how I set my KPIs. Um, I've done that for like uh, in a year and a half um, half's time. Just now, I had this conversation, and I think they're very achievable, which is exciting. And then I speak one of my close friends. Um, she's also a woman, and she um, she really loves fundraising. So um, so I then talk to her about like the bit of a how, how to how to formulate my vision and stuff. So uh, the two angles really helped me. Mm. How has advancement in tech changed the way that founders can access investment? Well, I think there are obviously the crowdfunding platforms. Um, and I'm sure there's some sort of marketplace for VCs or things you can read up. Um, we have done it the very traditional way of like introductions and I love speaking to other founders about their investors and who they would recommend. But we had a very interesting series of meeting with one of the crowdfunding companies and where they, for me they were the, the image or the idea I had about them was that you use them in the beginning, um, you know, when you have a nice concept, but really there's some that you can use at a much later stage if um, you want to have the public call on your company as a brand awareness tool and to, in order to create like 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 uh, brand advocates. Yeah, a few, a few big companies have done it recently and then you have ads on the tube and I think it's a really exciting uh, way of using technology to raise money and, and just get your name out there. Mm. It's definitely been a, a huge increase in the number of people using crowdfunding and, and as you say not just taking it from early stage but into later stage companies yeah. now too. I think the other one with, with um, you know technology and, um, and the advancement of, of, with accessing investment is clearly about that matching you know how can we bring people closer together and I think you know, there's yeah. you know, sites like Deal Room and other you know broker based websites that are, that are you know, completely focused on the idea of matching people up. Mm -hmm. Because at the heart of investment, it is about finding the mm -hmm. right match, right? And that's um, being able to tell your story and the people who want to hear that story who believe in that vision. And, yeah. and technology is certainly making that easier. Why might a founder be apprehensive about honest financial conversations with investors? Oh gosh, it's such a hard one to answer, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, the psychology around not being honest. I, I can understand why people feel that they have to absolutely put on that show um, because there's this vision of, 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 or expectation of what a founder should look like. And, and um, it's, it's such an interesting culture that we've had come out of Silicon Valley and then go around the entire world of this incredibly all on, all the time founder that you know lives and breathes and sleeps just their business and nothing else mm -hmm. um, and I think it's such a, a negative culture now and the burnout culture ha has to move on yeah. and there's nothing sustainable about it and I mean I've, I don't know about you but I've, I've been close to burnout before I've been very public about talking about that uh, I think was... every founder has been like <laughs> after like two and a half three years yeah exactly yeah. I'm 20 years and I'm doing about yeah. being a founder so I definitely I mean I was doing IVF at the same time as a oh, startup God, yeah. and you've been through pregnancies and a startup, and it's a really hard time. And of course, you feel like you need to put on this perfect face for everybody so they have full belief in you, and then you're supposed to do that for your team. And what I realized is that all those things led to a place where um, I wasn't being my true self and I wasn't giving what I needed to bring my best stuff to the business. Yeah. Uh, and I have this. This two percent of me—that's the most important part of me—and that part is really irreplaceable within our business. Um, and I need to be able to protect that, and that requires getting good sleep and eating well, um, and not just focusing on the business. Having yeah. family time, uh, yeah. being able to see things more creatively, and when I do that, everybody else benefits. Yeah. So.
yeah, I don't, and I think I disagree with the question a little bit in the sense of that um, uh, maybe there is a firm that's apprehensive about honest financial conversations, but what's there to hide? You know, you have mm. like spreadsheets, uh, management accounts, uh, all sorts of things. Like, there's nothing to hide, and then you can't hide it. <laughs> yeah, and then you have to. Um, I think what you have to demonstrate with regards to your finances is that you have a plan. Um, I'm, I'm, I think. Uh, some people might call it strategy, but it's more who I am. When it gets to talking about the business or numbers, I'm, I talk about the, the, the things that are not as pretty very, very quickly mm. because um, it's, it's, it's how I am. I'm more interested in solving the problem than the things that are going well. If they're going well, it's sort of like, yeah, great, a bit boring. Let's focus on the things that are not going well and get them to do well. Mm and I highlight them and how I tackle them and that's just because they interest me so much. It's like sharing my passion. How do you feel after spending a large amount of money? It's funny because um, yeah, as a CEO you often get approached for like, you know, from people who want you to spend money and um, I have to say no a lot of times because I'm, I'm trying to grow the company in a very lean way at the moment. And my philosophy is that I'm very happy to spend huge amounts of money. I have no problem with it, but only when I see predictable growth. Like if I, if I invest into something, I'm like, show me that this investment will give us return in terms of revenue, and I'm very happy to spend whatever. But we are really past the stages where we can invest, um, you know, to try things. And so our principle is. Um, just invest very small amounts with tests. The test is successful, invest a little bit more, proof concept, and then invest mm. whatever is required and makes sense. Mm. We are uh, having originated from New Zealand uh, as a general rule. We're very, very tight with money. So spending money within the business, um, large amounts, generally makes me feel quite sick. I'm very, very cautious and yeah. um, I'm an incredibly good budgeter and, and making sure that every pound we have uh, goes as far as it possibly can. How easy is it for founders to access fundraising outside of their home countries and how can they make the most of it? Do you want to go first? I feel like this is a question for yeah. me. <laughs> uh, the, the, the simple answer is um, it's not easy. Uh, being in market is crucial so that's why I'm here. Um, I moved myself to London so that, that's hard. So personally it, it's really hard. Um, it's also difficult because you don't have your networks. Um, in New Zealand, um, I'm a, a really well-known founder. Um, I've been around for a long time. I've got a really good track record. I've yeah. um, exited businesses. Um, I can get any meeting I wanted to get. Here, I'm an unknown entity, and I am literally starting from scratch. Being the ridiculous um, overachiever that I like to be, <laughs> it's a challenge that I've taken on, and. Um, I mostly thrive in, I really love yeah. that, but um, it is hard, it is definitely harder, uh, it's yeah. not impossible, but it's the advantages of going to school here or going to university here and having the networks of people is a, is a huge leg up, because yeah. funding comes from networks. Yeah, and then the personal part behind it, it's yes, exactly. amazing de dedication. But I think I can answer a little bit because mm. I'm Austrian and I moved to the UK about 10 years ago and I spent about five years to get to the career stage I was in, in Austria five years earlier wow. mm. in the English medical system and it was so difficult on a personal level to um, to just go through all these stages and it, I think it made me like a, a better person um, and it taught me patience and, uh, and stuff but what's so important and the same for fundraising I'm, I'm Austrian and now European and, <laughs> and we're here in the, in the UK um, I think if you want to get anywhere in another country you have to truly um, you have to analyze the culture the behavior the language and you have to adapt you cannot come and like stick through with your way of doing things or, or, or the, the way it was done in your uh, home country and then think That's you so speak true. the sa same language and so um, one thing I have to add to that is that I find London or England is very very uh, like embraces um, other cultures other languages very much and they are very open yeah so uh, London is a great place for people not from London to raise money but you still have to adapt mm. to the way people tend to do things here, yeah, but it's it's easy, I find, to adapt I, to that. There's a really um, salient point uh, for me. 
But actually what I've learned over the last two years is to unlearn a lot of things that worked at home. Don't yeah. work here. And actually if I try to run at my pace within the, the client base here, mm -hmm. I scare them and they don't want me to move them that quickly. They have a pace that they're very comfortable with yeah. and actually it's up to me to acclimatize and assimilate into yeah. their world and it's been a really big learning curve for me to do that, to build yeah. long-term strategic relationships, yeah. not short wins, fast wins, quick wins yeah. and um, actually would be the one thing I'd pass back to Kiwi founders coming up here yeah. is to slow down. Does talking about fundraising in cycles affect the ways founders can access investment? There was sort of a phase where there was like the dot-com boom and that extended and everything was very much in like put into boxes but I think the boxes are becoming wider and people are, um, are more understanding of the fact that businesses are living machines and don't behave according to some publications or some sort of um, unicorns that, that, that dictated a certain way um, companies should behave so I, th I feel like Things have improved a lot from that perspective, but I feel like that that's very much shifting. Mm. Um, and um, I feel there's much more respect for businesses that are, um, you know, maybe not, um, uh, that, that are actually making money and growing in a normal way and, 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 and just, um, yeah, not just doing, not just copying what other companies have done before. Mm. I'm definitely with you on that one. I think that the funding cycles are less prescriptive than potentially people might think they are from the outside. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look on a crunch base and see that, you know, a company has had a seed, then a series A and B and C, and, it, and it's all fantastic retrospectively. But when you're in there, there's so much more fluidity to it. I mean, our seed rounds have continued on for a long time into a official series a and yeah. and even then will it be an official series a it, it might not be it could be an extended eis round at the end of the day as a founder who needs cash to do the development side of it to get to the piece of the puzzle to do the vision that we you know, bring the vision to life in the way that we see I, I care less about what the funding cycle is called than i do about being able to access yeah. the the right people who have the right connection to what we are trying to achieve and can help fund that journey for us and if it helps later on you know organize it into a, a, a better cap table that yeah. helps um, an acquisition process brilliant but I, I don't know if it adds much more value than that nowadays it's so yeah. much more fluid